The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Animals cannot advocate for themselves. But tonight we've got two stories which highlight how their circumstances offer insight about them and lessons for us. First, we'll find out why a feral cat population boom in one eastern Ontario city hit a crisis point, prompting citizens to ask some hard questions. Then, explorer and author James Raffin takes us through the life cycle of a polar bear, evoking the growing perils they face, not of their own making. It's Tuesday, November 24th, and that's next on The Agenda. For several years now, the small eastern Ontario city of Cornwall has had a cat crisis, and not a small one. It's been dealing with hundreds of wild or feral cats wreaking havoc in neighborhoods and the wider ecosystem. But as the TVO original documentary, Running Wild, The Cats of Cornwall, explores, this is not really a cat problem, but a human one. The documentary has its world premiere tonight, right after this program, and we're pleased that it brings to our virtual studio some of its key voices. From Cornwall, Ontario, Melissa Alpins. She is the founder of Tiny But Mighty Kitten Rescue. In Guelph, Ontario, Elizabeth Gao, adjunct professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of Guelph. And in the Corsa Italia neighborhood of the provincial capital, there's Aaron Hancocks. He's the director and writer of the documentary Running Wild, The Cats of Cornwall. Uh, nice to have you all on our program tonight. And uh, Aaron, uh, kudos to you. This is a terrific documentary. You've really captured the problem uh, in its essence. I want to understand, though, what, uh, what compelled you to make the documentary in the first place? Thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, our company, Markham Street Films, uh, had been really interested in exploring the idea that cats were an, an invasive species. And uh, it just so happened that the situation in Cornwall popped on my radar and the uh, stars aligned and we had a film. So you're not from Cornwall, you didn't grow up there, you don't have that connection? My family all lives in the Ottawa area, which is very close. So I think they, they probably shared with me the, the news of Cornwall. So I can have them to thank for it. Gotcha. Now, the cats that are in question here, feral cats, domestic cats, all of the above, what? Yes, domestic cats are really the species, and uh, feral cats are unowned cats that live outdoors. And we're dealing with really any cat that lives outdoors, whether it be feral, an owned pet that goes outside. But uh, feral cats are particularly problematic. Okay, let's take a little snippet of what you've been able to create, and then we'll come back and chat some more. Sheldon, if you would, the clip. They were just found loose in the plant. Yeah, our forklift guy, he thought it was rats. <coughs> Adorable, right? <laughs> How old are you? You look like my other babies. Yeah, you have teeth. Good baby. So somehow they're making their way in here. They're having their litters or they're being dropped off. We used to take them home, but yeah, you, know, you can't take them all home. That's the I know. Problem. Melissa makes a, uh, a starring appearance in that clip there. We'll talk to her a little more in a second, but let's still set this up. Uh, Elizabeth, you're the pro in this picture, and I, I, I guess we need to understand, how did Cornwall get to be the feral cat capital of the province? Yeah, well, the situation in Cornwall is uh, kind of an extreme example of what can happen when a whole variety of different factors kind of come together. So we, one of the things we think about is the human element in issues with cats. And so cats that are outside, those are cats that, as Aaron mentioned, that people put outside. They're cats that don't have owners. And so what's happened in Cornwall is people have put their cats outside that um, aren't spayed and neutered. There's cats that people dump outside when they don't want them. And those cats freely reproduce. And so they have a lot of babies. And those babies, we get hundreds and hundreds of babies a year um, from multiple cats, or actually thousands in the case of Cornwall. And so the situation in Cornwall is... We just have a lot of cats that are outside and they're causing nuisance in people's yards. They're hunting um, animal, wild animals. 
And they're just a big problem because when we have a lot of a species that doesn't belong in, a, in an area, that creates a lot of problems. So this is what they mean in the documentary when they say it's, it's not really a cat problem, it's a human problem, right? People are, it's, yes. it, it, people are at fault here. Yeah, it, it is our fault. Um, you know, it's not the cat's fault. It really is our fault for not taking responsible ownership of our pets, uh, for for not not really <laughs> taking the value that cats need in our society. So it, it's a societal problem and it's a people problem. And it's also an economic problem. There's other aspects involved, such as it's really expensive to spay and neuter your cat um, unless it's subsidized. So a lot of people can't afford it. And if you're putting your cat outside and it's not spayed or neutered, that doesn't lead to the best situation where that cat can reproduce. Um, it can come in contact with other cats. There may spread disease. It, there's a wide variety of different problems that can come, arise out of this. Mm -hmm. Now, Elizabeth and Aaron, you're not going to take offense if I say this, but I'm saving the best for last here, which means Melissa. Melissa, I got to say, you are doing God's work. I mean, you, you rescue you. these cats. You love these cats. You try to get them placed in permanent homes. You take care. I mean, it's it's clear. It's clear. Your um, I mean, you you are just in love with with these little helpless animals. And I see one of them making a cameo in the background already, which is wonderful. But I need to know why do you do it? Why do I do it? I love cats, and I previously volunteered at our local shelter, and I figured out that they were euthanizing little orphan kittens. Um, so. I tried to let them, I tried to figure out how to let them foster. Like I would, I was willing to pay for it, but unfortunately they denied me. So I started my own rescue and this is where we are. Do you have any idea how many cats you've rescued and, and seen back to health already? My numbers are low because I don't intake a lot of kittens at a time to avoid like super high vet bills and spreading disease, but I'm pretty close to a hundred right now. And over what period of time would that be? Um, since 2017. And how many cats have you got in the house right now? There's only two right now who um, were found in a backyard and they're orphan kittens because they don't know where the mother is. And if you didn't do what you do, Melissa, what do you think the impact would be? Well, my main focus is to rescue the orphans in the town. And actually, I'd taken kittens from around the areas too, but there's no really help for orphan kittens, um, so that's what I try to focus on. Um, some, like I guess the kittens um, need help, obviously, because their mothers are missing or they've been hit by a car or something tragic like that. So I take in um, the orphans when I can. And just to be clear, you're, you're, like, th this is not a job for you. No one's paying you to do this, I presume, right? No, this is all volunteer work. Volunteer work out of the goodness of your heart. Yeah. Well, good for you. That's great. Aaron, what, um, maybe you could describe for us, what's been the city of Cornwall's approach to this problem? Uh, my understanding is that in 2008, the, the city made a concerted effort to try and, and, and fix the problem, partnering with the OSPCA, a uh, charitable organization, and that at a certain point, uh, the OSPCA and the city just ran out of resources and steam and said, this is really beyond our capacity to, 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 to fix this problem. And as a uh, um, Dr. Gao mentioned, when when the 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 problem exists, it can spread exponentially because cats breed so much. So it, if it's left unchecked, it just runs wild, and, and that's what happened. Is over the past ten or twelve years, the situation just became uh, so bad that it reached a crisis level. That it started making uh, news headlines, which is of course how I found out about it and found out about Melissa's work. Hmm. In which case, Elizabeth, why don't more people spay or neuter their cats? If they did, presumably this problem goes away. Yeah, it's a very it's a very complicated situation because it's expensive to spay or neuter your cat. Um, it takes time, and a lot of people don't have those resources. So the problem with with cats is we often think of them as a bit of dispendable animals. We treat them a little bit that we treat them quite differently than dogs. So people sometimes that. They want a pet, they don't have a lot of money, so they get a cat. But to spay and neuter a cat, we're talking of sometimes a few hundred dollars. That's a lot of money for some people. And so we really need um, subsidized spay and neuter to, to get people to be able to spay and neuter their cats. And also bringing that spay and neuter, for instance, to clinics um, or even a mobile spay and neuter uh, 
unit close to where people are that really need it. So it's it's quite complicated, but it's um, you know we need to provide the resources to help people get their cats spayed and neutered. In which case, Melissa, pr presumably entreaties have been made to the city council in Cornwall to help subsidize a spay and neutering program. Uh, what's been the effect of that? Well, it's been a little difficult with COVID. I think it has delayed their entire plan to bring the mobile clinic more frequently. Um, and I know the shelter has been closed since March, as far as I'm aware. So they've been directing people to my rescue, which has been difficult. Um, and I guess we just have to continue waiting for the mobile clinic to come back when they can. Hmm. Now, you live in Cornwall, right? Yes. So you're on the ground. You'd be able to best answer this question. How do the people in Cornwall feel about the fact that cats are running all over their city? Uh, there are certain parts of the city where it's pretty bad. Um, you have to see them at certain times of the day because when it's cold, they're hiding, and when it's super hot, they're hiding. Um, but it is bad. Um, we're just, I guess, we're thankful that the city has finally helped us and put money in the budget for the year. Um, but hopefully moving forward, they'll continue to put money in every year um, hmm. for the budget. Now, Elizabeth, I want to ask you about an expression that Aaron used at the top of our interview tonight, and that is he described cats in Cornwall as, quote unquote, an invasive species. Mm -hmm. That is that is not how we tend to think of cats. You know, we think of invasive species as, uh, I don't know what, bugs infesting agriculture or trees or something like that, but not yeah. cats in cities. What, uh, why that expression? Well, it... <laughs> A lot of people, we don't think of cats as invasive species because there are pets, there are companion animals, there are family members, but when cats are outside, they're very wild. And they're actually, cats are very recently evolved from their ancestors, which are African wild cats. So we think of African wild cats are a small cat that look almost identical to some of the cats that we have in our houses that roam the Sahara and they roam Africa. and so the cats that we have are very much like those cats. So they have this wild side to them. And when we put cats outside, they're not from North America. They've come over here with uh, the colonization of North America several hundreds of years ago. And so they're very similar to a lot of these other species that we think of, a purple loosestrife or emerald ash borel beetle uh, that are invasive species. They don't belong here. Then they're outside. They cause huge environmental impacts. In Canada alone, cats kill 100 to 350 million. So that's millions of birds every single year, which is astronomical. They spread disease. Uh, they spread disease to other cats. They spread disease to wild animals. And they can even spread it to humans. So they can spread it to us, such as toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite. And that gets into the environment. And, and that spreads to us. It spreads to other animals. And that's actually found all over the world. And that's from cats. So they're a huge problem. And we don't tend to think of them as invasive species because they're our pets. But when they're outside, they're very wild. And they're like a wild predator that we've suddenly put into our environment. Now, Elizabeth, presumably they're they're killing a lot of mice and rats too. We gotta be happy about that, aren't we? Yeah, so cats do kill some of these pest animals, but what um, scientists have found is that they actually kill even more native species. So in Ontario, these are our voles, these are our moles um, and chipmunks and sometimes squirrels and rabbits. And so these are species that are originally found here, and they're important for the health of our environment. And cats are capturing those animals at even higher rates than they are a pest species. So those are uh, mice and, and rats. So it's quite concerning when cats are actually hunting all the species we want. Um, and, and that's not a good thing. Hmm. Now, Aaron, you've obviously chronicled the situation in Cornwall. Uh, but I presume Cornwall isn't the only place in the province of Ontario where this is an issue. Where else might it be a problem? Uh, honestly, the, the situation in Cornwall is really indicative of a situation that's problematic all over the world. Um, wherever a city hasn't taken really decisive action to solve this problem, it will become an issue. Because as Elizabeth has said, uh, cats are not thought of the same way as dogs. And people think that cats are independent and they can just be left outside. So I know that, for example, Hamilton has a, 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 a cat, a feral cat problem on their hands, as, as well as many other places around Ontario. Ontario, Canada, and the world. When you say a feral cat problem, 
Uh, like, I'm from Hamilton. When I go back to the city, I, I, I must confess, I don't see cats running all over the city. So wh where is it a problem? Well, actually, in East End Hamilton, um, I was actually uh, doing research, and I went into certain neighborhoods. There's alleyways where there are dozens of cats uh, that live live in the alleyways around there. Um, it's a colony. And um, I think the idea with feral cats is you you wouldn't actually notice them if you were just to walk down downtown Hamilton, because feral cats do their very best, usually, to avoid human contact unless they're being fed by a, a known uh, feeder to them. So it actually made it difficult for us to film feral cats because they, they didn't trust us. We had to wait in, in alleyways and behind houses and set up hidden cameras to get images of these cats. And that's what makes it very tough and what makes Elizabeth's work very tough is to get good estimates on the number of cats. But there they are there. I believe, believe it. Oh, yeah, no, I do believe it. So just, just so I'm straight here, feral cats, bad. Tiger cats, good though, right? <laughs> Tiger Cat's good, absolutely. Very good. Okay, just just uh, for the CFL fans, I want to be clear about that. Melissa, I do want to ask you, as um, you know, as a cat lover, how do you feel about cats being described as an invasive species in your city? Uh, it's not ideal, I guess. Um, but it is true. Like there is too many cats in Cornwall and other areas um, that need help so that they don't reproduce out in the streets and cause uh, tons of orphan kittens who can't get help. Now, I should just check because <laughs> I keep yeah. seeing your, your uh, very adorable cats in the background in the shot there. Are the two cats that are there right now, are they cats that you have rescued and intend to place or are they yours? They are not mine. They are my foster kittens right now. Uh, they are Carter and Owen who came from a house. Um, they found them randomly all over their property, two little kittens. There might be more, but they didn't find them. Um, and they don't know where the mother is, so I took them in. And when you foster them, how long will you keep them for? Uh, depends right now because of the vet uh, appointment delays. Um, but usually they leave around 12 weeks, give or take. They leave around 12 weeks old. Now, I notice in the documentary, when it comes time for you to give the cats up, um, like, you take it in stride. Uh, you you. You're not crying. You're not uh, moping about uh, all over this, which is, I guess, a bit of a surprise because I'd, I'd have thought that you'd become fairly attached to them when you foster them for that length of time. How come? Uh, there was a clip that must not have been shown where I was crying. It is tough sometimes to let them go uh, because I literally love them like my own until they, they go to their families. But um, it is tough. So despite what was shown, it is still tough on me. Okay, so you're taking issue with Aaron's portrayal of you right now. Is that it? <laughs> I, I asked him not to use the clip of me crying, so it's not his fault. Oh, okay, okay. Why didn't you want the clip of you crying in there? It was just rough. That adoption was just rough. I get you. I get you. Now, yeah. Carter and Owen, why those names? I don't know. The names just came to me. I always, like, wait a bit to see what names fit them, and Carter and Owen were just the ones that I chose for them. Huh. Okay. Elizabeth, let me get you back in here right now. What, um, what is the province of Ontario able to do on this that it so far has not yet done? Well, uh, unfortunately, the issue of, of cats and what we can do isn't necessarily something the provincial government takes action to. It's usually done in, in local cities. So each municipality in Ontario is responsible for the, the bylaws and, and all, sort of all the aspects of controlling sort of human behavior related to cats. But there's a lot that um, I think we as like cat owners and just the general public can do. And that is really, again, as I, I've mentioned, is thinking about cats a, a bit differently. Thinking about them as, as our companion animals that we have a responsibility for, that we have to... Um, we have to provide enrichment for these cats. We have to uh, engage them in our homes so that they aren't being put outside. And so it, it's not necessarily something that, say, our, our government can do, but it's something that we as individuals have to take a lot of action. And sometimes that gets miscommunicated, that it's not, it's something that we, as every single citizen in Ontario, whether we're a cat owner or not, has to really take action on on this issue, and, and especially when we do have a cat of trying to keep it indoors. Hmm. Now, Aaron, you having looked at this issue, obviously, and having made the documentary, uh, have you come up with uh, some ideas for potential solutions to all of this? Yes, I think it's a situation where um, 
a lot of municipalities don't want to pay to fix the problem. Uh, fix, pardon the pun. <laughs> but uh, um, it's one of those situations where if you don't uh, fix the problem, it will only get worse and only get more expensive. So I don't think it's a question of should money be allocated. It's a question of how much and when. And earlier is better. Um, it just cannot go unchecked. And um, if there's a, a situation where the um, the tax base of a town or a municipality doesn't have the funds or it's an impoverished area, then the, the city needs to dig deep and, and help because this problem cannot go unchecked. Now there's, there's, the risks are too great. Right. You, you do tell a story in the documentary which is really disturbing, which is some feral cats outdoors and some neighbor decides that the best way to solve this problem is simply to poison the cats. Now, uh, presumably that's illegal, but how much of that is going on right now to the best of your knowledge? Anecdotally, there's a lot of that going on uh, um, anywhere. Uh, certainly in Cornwall, we heard about it. We heard about uh, poisoning, shooting, uh, and probably more common is uh, where uh, an unwanted cat is trapped and then released in the wild. And the outcome for that cat is uh, arguably worse than any other outcome because that cat will be forced to hunt for itself, fend for itself, and most likely become victim of a, of a coyote, frankly. So there's all kinds of terrible fates that uh, unowned cats can have, which is why people like Melissa take them in a, at a, a young enough age to try and socialize them so they can become pets rather than, than feral cats. Well, in fact, I learned in your documentary that if you're an inside cat, so-called inside cat, your lifespan's 12 to 18 years, but if you have to fend for yourself on the street, it's two to five years. So the cat's obviously going to have a better, healthier, happier, everything, life, longer, uh, if, if we do our part. I mean, that's one of the lessons here, isn't it, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is that cats should be kept indoors. And while I do find that sad, because as Elizabeth said, these are essentially wild animals, I, I think they would prefer to be outside. I don't think we can afford to do that environmentally. Um, and so then it becomes really a question of what can we do to make this cat's indoor life uh, as pleasing as possible. And I think cat, it, it is work. Yeah, a lot of people think owning a cat is easy. Just they fend for themselves to go outside, they entertain themselves. But if you have a in purely indoor cat, it's actually a lot of work to give that cat a ha happy life. You have to entertain it and stimulate it and play with it a lot. I thought cats were supposed to be left alone and dogs were supposed to be played with. <laughs> no, no, far from it. I mean, I have a, I have two rescue cats of my own. Uh, they were both born feral, and um, it is work. I'm working from home these days because of COVID, and uh, there's a lot of meowing going on. There's a lot of breaks I have to take to entertain them, uh, otherwise they won't leave me alone. Um, and it's it's like. Um, but they're really, I mean, they're like humans in the sense that humans need uh, activity. What if you took a human and said you can never leave the house? Well, I guess we're in that situation now with COVID. But <laughs> you have to stay at home and you can't get any exercise. Um, uh, cats are wild animals, really, or half wild animals. They need that stimulation. Um, and so, yeah, we really owe it to them. And, all, you know, there's other th indications. If, if a cat doesn't want to play, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't want to play. It just might mean it's given up and it's depressed and, and it, it doesn't, it's understimulated. Hmm. Now, we met Carter and Owen already. What are your cat's names? Um, you, I think you may have seen a, a tail cameo at one point, mm -hmm. but my cat's names are Bo and Fig. And named after whom? Um, Bo was uh, uh, actually... Um, uh, an abbreviation of his uh, his uh, foster name, so I can't really take full credit, but it's B E A U. He's a very handsome cat. He's ah. he's fluffy, and fluffy and black and, and majestic, and he's French. And um, and Fig is because my uh, my wife is Italian and uh, she loves uh, Mediterranean fruits. I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and what do you mean, Bo is French? <laughs> uh, I'm just joking. He has okay. uh, he has a French name. It kind of suits him. He's uh, you know. He, he has a joie de vivre, I understand. Okay, gotcha. Absolutely. Now, Elizabeth, I should get you to weigh in on, on this debate to the extent that there is a debate. Home cats, 12 to 18 years. Feral cats, mm -hmm. two to five years. What, it, does science prefer one over the other? Uh, well, it's, you know, as Aaron has kind of brought up, it, it's a tricky thing because cats have this, this sort of wild side. They have this very companion animal side. Some people actually call cats wild companions uh, because they have this wild side. They have this companion side. So it's it, it's really hard for, for cat owners. I, I 
I started, when I started working with cats, I thought, okay, all cats should be inside. There's no kind of other option. But when I've worked with cat owners, they're often very conflicted because they know how much their cat loves going outside. And, and I can, I can really feel what they're going through as at two o'clock in the morning, their cat's meowing to go outside. And all you want to do is put your cat outside. So it's really hard to change that behavior of your cat when you have a cat that is an outdoor cat to get it to be indoors. So that's really hard. But what a lot of people do is they get their next cat. That's going to be their indoor cat. And so that's what we're trying to really encourage people to do is that maybe you can't get your current cat to be indoors, but if you can get your next cat to be indoors and provide it with stimulation, as Aaron was mentioning, things that stimulate, um, or simulate the behavior that has outdoors. So that's climbing, that's um, hunting behavior. So it's playing with the cat. And another thing that cat owners can do is they can create catios. And these are actually enclosures, like a little fenced in enclosure that you can have outside. And even if you live in an apartment, people will make these little enclosures on their windows or their um, their decks for the cat to go in. So then they're actually getting um, exposure to the outdoors. They're seeing things go by. They're seeing the animals. They're, they're getting fresh air. So it's kind of like their little, little cage outside. And so these are things that cat owners can do. And I think it's really important to remember in, if you do have a cat to think about sort of the, the costs and benefits of uh, putting your cat outside. So there are benefits and in, in people put their cats outside because they get more exercise. They It's part of who they are in many ways to be outside. They don't like being contained. But the downfall of having, being outside is that cats, when um, they – they hunt, they capture wild animals, which are not good for the, the health of our environment. And they also can be hit by cars. They can be eaten by coyotes. Um, they can spread disease to themselves, other, um, other wild animals to humans, and they can get in fights. And so their lives outside are, are actually not that good, particularly when we're talking about feral cats that spend their entire lives outside. It's not really that good for them. They're not meant to be in this environment in, in the winter, which we're going into now. Cats don't have a good coat of fur to actually survive our winters very well. And so in, in Southern Ontario, we don't get super extreme winters, although you know some people may say they are. But if you go to other parts of Canada, um, in the prairie provinces where it gets really cold, like minus 30, some of those cats literally freeze to death huh. because they're not adapted to being outside. And as you do see cats that have ears frozen off or they have frostbite on their, their paws, which is really concerning from a, a welfare side of seeing these cats that are outside. And, and they're actually very unwell. Well, I want to thank the three of you for uh, coming on to TVO tonight and for participating in the making of the documentary because it's, it's just excellent and people are going to not only learn a lot, but of course they're going to fall in love with some of the people and animals that are in this documentary. Uh, Running Wild, the Cats of Cornwall, on right after this program tonight. Aaron, Melissa, Elizabeth, great of you to join us on TVO. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. After four decades living and working in the circumpolar world of Canada's far north, explorer and author James Raffin made an unusual choice for his new book. In order to help people truly understand the reality and science of what's at stake there for polar bears and for people, he's written not a textbook or a polemic, but an imaginative work that hitches a ride with a most remarkable protagonist. The book is called Ice Walker, a polar bear's journey through the fragile Arctic and it brings James Raffin back to our airwaves tonight from Kingston, Ontario. And it's so good to have you back on this program. I don't think you've been on TVO. We're certainly not on, on our program for about 13 years. So it's great to see you again. Still alive, Steve. Great to see you. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> We're both still hanging in there, I guess. Okay, good. I want to start by just reading an excerpt of the book, and then we'll come back and chat. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up, and away we go. The story that follows has its genesis in my belief that the intertwining worlds of northern bears and northern peoples offer deep wisdom that the rest of us could use to adjust our behavior in response to climate change. In spite of unanimity in the scientific community about its existence and graphic evidence of its accelerating effects on our lives through flooding, sea level rise, forest fires, and increased catastrophic weather events around the world, very little of what we see and hear seems to translate into action. I want to just start there. Why do you think that's the case, that very little is translating into action? I think we've created, um, and I'll indict myself 
with with everybody. I think we've created generations of very smart consumers and polluters. And um, it was actually, uh, you know, after 20 something books I've written and edited that were aimed at the front part of people's brains, Steve, um, I, I've done script writing for a bunch of very creative filmmakers. And I realized that in that amalgam, that 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 intoxic uh, that that incredible amalgam of sound and image and idea filmmakers aren't aiming so much at your head as they are at your heart and and I, I I'm convinced more so than ever that we don't act on what we know we act on what we feel and I wondered what a book might like look like uh, that was aimed at somebody's heart first well, I can tell you, mission accomplished, because this book really does aim right at your heart. You tell the story of a, how do I put this? You, you've sort of, um, you've made up the story of a, of a fictitious bear, but of course, all the details of the story are true. And I wonder how you hope, by using that story and getting us to sort of fall in love with that polar bear, how you hope that might change behavior. Well... Um, the last line of my last book called Circling the Midnight Sun is we are the bear. And that was sort of a, a, a you know, a side shot on, on Al Gore's amazing 28 seconds of video in An Inconvenient Truth that, with a bear swimming around in a warming sea looking for a place to call home. And I think we are the bear. But, you know, bears images, uh, bear images have been used to sell, you know, cars, consulting, cameras, um, Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola, cough drops, conservation, it doesn't seem to matter. So they're already the poster child, the poster cub for climate change in the Arctic. And, and it does bug me a little bit that most of those images are presenting bears in an unpeopled wilderness um, because the Arctic is not unpeopled by any means. But bears are already in people's consciousness. And I thought, uh, what about uh, going to the bear and going much deeper into the bear's life because so that people might really all I wanted to do and it's it's easier to say than it is to do I wanted to create a space in which people could consider uh, themselves ourselves uh, like it's a portrait of humanity in 30 months in the life of a bear in the hope that that space might be a different context or opportunity to ponder how how we live our lives. I'm just going to take this moment to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond. Sheldon, sort of top third of page two, we've got the bear and Coke. And let's, since it was just referenced, let's bring that up right now. Coca-Cola has very effectively used the, the cuddly polar bear to sell more Coca-Cola. And, uh, you know, even when we used to be allowed to go to movies and these commercials would come on and people would get all misty-eyed when they saw those heart-tugging ads that they put on. But the question I want to ask is, you know, they're using polar bears, but are they actually helping polar bears? Is corporate Canada, is, is the corporate world contributing to helping polar bears at all? Well, I, I presume it is because they uh, they wouldn't use bears so so uh, aggressively in, in advertising. Um, and Coca-Cola, to their credit, I suppose, uh, made uh, some sort of arrangement and deal with the World Wildlife Fund to create a, a project called Arctic Home. And you may remember um, polar bears are actually on cans of different types of Coca-Cola and, and um, at least in, in this market. And some of that, some of the proceeds of that went to conservation work. Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, but it does, I mean, those ads, the Arctic Home Project really bothered me because um, you could go into the, the website having had your Coca-Cola and it would talk about Arctic Home and you could adopt a polar bear and you could learn a lot of interesting things about polar bears, but it didn't acknowledge that Arctic is home for, you know, 4 million people around the circumpolar world and that 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 kind of bugged me. but. Um, you know, I have waded into this territory, Steve, in the hope that um, people might might um, might consider that, but go beyond the sort of uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, notion of a bear as a cuddly uh, fellow mammal denizen of the beautiful, frozen, and threatened North. 
Well, I, I guess you could have chosen any animal you wanted to make the point that you want to make, but you did choose the polar bear. How come? Well, that's, uh, it brings in another thread in the motivation here, and that is that, uh, you know, as a kid growing up on the banks of the mighty Speed River in Guelph, Ontario, I really, really wanted to be a marine biologist. And, uh, you know, the stuff of my childhood reading and adventures was imagining me as, uh, uh, you know, uh, out there doing research. Um, and I, that led me to a substantive experience as a young biologist doing an analysis of the spectral sensitivity of a polar bear in a closed and dark room in the, at the University of Guelph. And um, that, I, I left that, I, and I have felt terrible since then, and I hold a debt to that bear whose number was Canadian Wildlife Service 007, uh, but his name was Huxley, named by my now deceased colleague Robin Best uh, for his godfather, Julian Huxley. But um, that uh, I, I have felt through, well, that was in the mid 70s, and I've felt since then that uh, I needed to, to atone somehow to Huxley uh, for, for abandoning him in a cage at the University of Guelph. What happened to Huxley eventually? Well, it's um, he became a study skin in the vertebrate anatomy lab at uh, the University uh, of Guelph. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I got a, a remarkable honor and opportunity, which was an invitation from the president of the university to come to address the graduating class. and. In biological sciences, which is kind of funny, but I had to fess up there, and uh, they said, "Ah, oh, you're, you know, I was there for a couple of days," and they said, "You know, you can. What, what would you like to do when you're here?" And I said, "Well, you know, this bear in the '70s, da 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 da." Anyway, at uh, 3:30 on this day, um, I went to the vertebrate anatomy lab, and there was the chief demonstrator, and there was a bear that I recognized, um, a bear skin <laughs> of a bear that I recognized, which I have to say is one of the most surreal moments of, uh, of my life. I'll bet. I want to talk to you a bit now about the three-letter word that is in the title of this book and that, frankly, is a huge character in this book, which is the word ice. So let's start with the title, Ice Walker. There's a double entendre there. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, we are the bear uh, in a lot of ways. We are walking on thin ice. Uh, curiously, Steve, and this is where the beauty of the uh, editorial collaboration comes in. I wrote this book over years as walking ice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it was the good marketing people and my editorial confreres and collaborators at Simon & Schuster who real, uh, convinced me that, that this needed to be a noun, ice walker. And uh, um, so that's that's where it came from. Um, I, I And I love the simplicity of the idea, uh, but the connection between uh, bear and ice and footprints and all of that comes together. Uh, because a bear, I mean, it's Ursus maritimus. This is this is a sea bear, and uh, they need ice, and uh, so, and the ice is disappearing. So, and I, I I love that you have identified the ice as a character because because it is, <laughs> <laughs> it's a living, a living, breathing uh, 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 thing in in the story. And that ice, that character, is disappearing from the life of polar bears, and I guess we need to get a better understanding of how much of that is our fault. Um, why don't we start there? How much, of the, how much of the fact that this is disappearing is our fault? Well, I would say the, the majority of it. Uh, if you believe in anthropogenic climate change um, and you look at the uh, length of the winter available to, for example, the polar bear populations in southwestern Hudson Bay, the length of the winter, the length of time in which ice is on the bay uh, is, um, 
is is diminishing markedly since the industrial revolution and we've kept closer tabs on the actual number of days that there is ice available for hunting uh, more so in the last four decades than previous time before that, going back to the 19th century. But bears are creatures of the ice. The ice is disappearing, and I don't care how you slice it, that is a problem for the ice walker. How much of the problem stems from too much hunting? I would say, I mean, there are people who, who argue about this more than anything, but my argument in the, in the book is that in order to understand and to consider one species like the polar bear, you need to understand that that bear is integrated into the lives of northern peoples. And to suggest that somehow hunting is um, uh, for for uh, subsistence hunting, to suggest that that is somehow causing the disappearance of the polar bear, I would disagree uh, vehemently that that is the case. Now, there are people who want to point to that and say, no, that, this is not possible. But I think conservation, as it needs to move forward, um, you know, the idea of a conservation economy, I think it needs to have uh, uh, people written into the conservation algorithm uh, because that people, landscape, and natural phenomena are totally interrelated. So to pull out the polar bear and say we need to, to we need to support this, I would argue that we also need to consider ways to perpetuate the cultures and practices and traditions and family community um, uh, uh, practices of northern peoples whose lives have been integrated with the polar bear uh, in, for since since time began. I totally take your point on that. And, and let's acknowledge right now that here's two white guys talking about indigenous culture and the integration of the polar bear in that culture for thousands and thousands of years. Having said that, I, I think I read in your book that there's 25,000 polar bears left in total. And, and you know, one, one, I'm just asking the question. I don't know the answer. Do we have to do something? Maybe it's a moratorium. I don't know, in order to protect them more when they seem so very vulnerable to extinction right now. I don't think you will find a more uh, cogent conservation scheme uh, than a conservation scheme or, or agenda that is written by and with northern people who understand bears as well as scientists, but in, in very, very different ways. And we need, to, we need to work together to do that. But the threat, I mean, it's not Northern peoples who are making the winter shorter. And let's face it, Steve, a bear does not eat, I mean, it needs uh, fat of seals, whether they're bearded seals or ring seals, it needs marine mammal fat. Bears don't drink fresh water. They survive on metabolic water, which is you know, like you burn your fire to make your s'mores. The carbon in wood turns into carbon dioxide in water. Bears burn f uh, fat, seal fat, to create carbon dioxide and water that they use for all their water needs. But they need to get a certain amount of fat on board so that they can go ashore. And in the days when the summer was two months long, no problem uh, fasting for two months, even harder when you're a, a pregnant pregnant female, but when the summer is six months long and you don't come ashore with enough fat, uh, that's a problem. And that is a problem that is not being caused by northern hunting, northern peoples integrated with it. It's a problem that is caused by the shortening of the winter, which in my book is caused by all of the uh, anthropogenic uh, climate change factors that that uh, we're, we're so inc incredibly clever about, but yet don't seem to be able to integrate into our lives in a way that makes much difference. Gotcha. I want to read something else that you wrote. This is not from the book Ice Walker. This is from a piece you did for the Globe and Mail not too long ago. And um, here we go. Sheldon, bring this up if you would. If we lose the polar bears, we are also losing the very thing that many would argue distinguishes us from animals in the first place. The ability to choose our paths, to have rational dominion over our animalistic instincts, to enact the human wherewithal, to put morality into action, and to create a better version of the world we live in. By choosing not to alter our behavior in any meaningful way, despite all evidence pointing to how destructive it is, we are losing part of what it means to be human. And I wonder as well, James, whether, given that probably two-thirds of the world's polar bears live in Canada, 
whether we Canadians have a special responsibility to deal with this. What do you think? <laughs> Gee, that sounds like a rant. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was kind of teeing yeah, you up for one. <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, you know, I want to be the Canadian and say, you know, I'm sorry I said that. I'm not sorry I said that. And what do we have a special responsibility? Uh, yes, I think we do. But uh, we and, and this is one of the reasons why when when our politicians reach out to other uh, governments, to other leaders, global leaders to create solutions, um, uh, that that makes me very happy. And, and we can talk more about that if you like. But, um, you know, we uh, polar bears are alive and well in our in our consciousness and I think we have a lot of uh, people in the north who know polar bears and so yes I think I think if, if we bear I mean it's almost like an opportunity that Canadians have because there are the preponderance of polar bears are in this country but um, I think we have an opportunity here to 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 show leadership as we are and in in, in coming forward with uh, complex and integrated cross-cultural solutions to um, finding policies and finding laws and governance strategies that will take us forward together. Um, uh, and and in, in the Canadian example, I think, is quite powerful in that respect, uh, because a lot of people turn turn to us um, in the Middle Earth, if you like, turn to us for that that kind of leadership because we are a northern nation. I know you said it in your last book, but you do repeat it in this book as well near the back. And I'll just read a couple of lines of it. You say, by better understanding the bear, we better understand ourselves. We can do better. We must do better. We are the bear, as my northern friends have known all along. You know, most of us in this country, though, live within two hours of the American border. We'll never see a polar bear in our lives. And I wonder whether you think it's a tough sell to convince people that they ought to care about something that is so out of sight and out of mind. How tough a sell is that? Well, Steve, you and I both have PCBs circulating in our bodies. We have heavy metals. We have uh, experienced uh, catastrophic climate events. We are living in a world where the, uh, the, the seasons are shifting as a result of, of climate change. And uh, we are carrying with us already, those of us in North America, images of polar bears already. So I, I really am hoping that by animating the idea of a polar bear as us, we might consider that those uh, issues the bear is facing uh, are AR issues, but also not that far away. Um, the world is getting smaller. I mean, Polar Bears International, are, they were just on Twitter yesterday showing that they've got new broadcast facilities for polar bear cams. I mean, they're doing amazing work. So is the, uh, the World Wildlife Fund. I mean, in not only supporting important scientific research, but also in bringing, bringing the, uh, the, the, the sort of the, the circumstance of the bear closer to the marketplace. And uh, it's just not that far. But that question that you ask is one that really rattles around in my head too about you know why should we care when the, those things are that far away and I mean the title of my last book Circling the Midnight Sun had a subtitle that was um, climate and uh, uh, talked about the invisible Arctic and the invisible Arctic in my mind are the people who live there and that book was really an ampl amplification tool for the voices that I heard in three years going around the circle and, and in a way bears don't talk I didn't want them to talk but in a way Ice Walker is another Another amplification of 40 years of listening um, to, let's call it the voices of the bear and the bear people in the Arctic. And, and this is me as a, as a writer trying to bring those voices here and to make them present. And I think making them present and simplifying the story was why the creation of this book took so damn long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you stuck it out because it's worth reading. Let me raise, uh, okay, you, you raised some political issues not too long ago, and I want to return to those because the Prime Minister of the country did receive an award from National Geographic, and um, we have the tweet, actually, of it here. It says, in recognition of his leadership in the protection of Canada's marine and terrestrial life, we are pleased to present Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada with the Planetary Leadership Award. And I'd be curious as to what your view of that recognition is. 
Well, I'm always a little bit dubious. I mean, quite often these these sort of grand gestures um, are as much about shedding light on the sponsoring organization, you know, the strivings of the sponsoring organization as they are about the fine qualities of the recipients, maybe with Goldman or Nobel left out of that. But having said that, um, I think... Um, you know, I would give Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, a medal for not being Stephen Harper uh, at, in the early days. But in this case, the the recognition, and it was interesting to see it come forward, that it actually uh, highlighted um, the the agreement that the government of Canada came up with, the Kikitani Inuit Association and the government of Nunavut, to create um, Talarutuyap Amanga, and I mangled that, but the Lancaster Sound Marine Protected Area, which is nearly a half a million square kilometers of, of, of area. And I have to say, I mean, if you look at the numbers, in, in Prime Minister Trudeau's time, and, and yeah, it's hard. Governing is way more complex than saying you're going to govern. And and I I don't I don't want to be the Prime Minister, and I, I wish him well with all of the things that he's dealing with. But in the in the marine protected area, you know, he's brought us from I don't know one percent to about thirteen or fourteen percent of the, and this is huge. And in the terrestrial areas, he's brought us forward there too. I don't want to get overly bogged down in the politics of all of this. However, you know, you did take a little drive-by smear at Stephen Harper there, and I think it's fair to say Stephen Harper probably went to the far north more than any prime minister in Canadian history and, and certainly moved along the idea of a northern university. And to the extent that he's remembered for one policy in particular, you know, I think you could make an argument that it was his commitment to the far north that it'd be somewhere high up that list. So how come that doesn't seem to resonate with you? Uh, Touche, uh, the image of uh, that prime minister standing on the, the bow of a uh, Canadian naval vessel that uh, can't go through ice uh, is a, just a classic situation. And, and yeah, maybe maybe it was a touch unfair. But um, the, the science that is being brought into the building of the conservation economy that are part of the... Uh, Taluruti Apimanga project, uh, there, there is, uh, I, I see this government uh, treating that type of data, that type of policy making uh, resource uh, differently than the previous government. And, um, you know, who am I to, to chirp from, from the shores of Cranberry Lake at some of these, these politicians, because uh, I do admire them in the fortitude in going forward. And I guess I would have to reluctantly say I even admire Stephen Harper for for, for uh, uh, working with the courage of his convictions. There you go. All the conservatives watching us are going to be happy now. Okay, good. <laughs> Let me, James, let's do one more thing here, and that is, you know, th there are a lot of neat, fun facts, if I can call them that, that one learns when reading your book, and you're almost, I mean, you're so captivated by the story, you're almost taking in this information by osmosis. You don't even realize you're learning something. Do you want to hit us with, um, with one or two just before we wrap this up? I started with polar bear vision, Steve, and when you think about uh, a creature, an animal, think about ourselves. That animal can hunt in 24-hour darkness and blinding 24-hour light. Think of the spring in the Arctic, you know, in March and April when the uh, you're coming off the equinox towards the solstice and it's brilliant 24-hour light. You know, this bear can function in both of those light conditions. It actually has a third eyelid that may serve as a sunglass or, uh, you know, an underwater vision that can it can hunt underwater. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, the fact that, uh, and I mentioned this before, the fact that they can, can live without drinking fresh water. I mean, the ice that they walk on is largely fresh, but eating ice is energetically a waste because it, well, it's just like if you or I, you know, get thirsty when out skiing and eat snow your body spends as much energy heating it up as it does on anything else but um uh you know the the whole birth process steve where the where there's the, there is delayed conception so mating happens on the ice at at one time in the year and then several months later the conceptus which is the the you know the the genetic material from the male and the female which has been kind of in suspended animation in the womb of the female it, it's months later when the female comes ashore and builds a den, and if she is, is physiologically able and right and, and to do that, and then
and magically, uh, yeah, I'm not a scientist anymore. And not that I ever <laughs> magic. Let's call it magically. Uh, the the conceptus keeps uh, keeps developing. Um, then there's the whole olfactory uh, pheromonal messaging that goes into the tracks of the bear. There's the fact that when uh, and then and then the relationship between bears and people in the mythology and cosmology of the north. You know that a polar bear's back foot goes into its front footstep, which is energetically a great thing because you're not breaking as much snow. But on the other hand, it looks like the bear has is walking on its hind legs. And I'm quite sure, Steve, I have never actually seen this with my own eyes, but I'm quite sure that bears do when nobody's looking when they do that. <laughs> and well, maybe they even dance. <laughs> I do have to say the scene that you describe in the book of the bears mating uh, will stay with me for a while. That was a rather terrifying description. Anyway, James Raffin, it's so good to have you back on our program. The name of the book is Ice Walker, A Polar Bear's Journey Through the Fragile Arctic. And um, you be well, sir, and we hope to see you again much sooner uh, than was the case last time. Lovely to talk with you, Steve. Good evening. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, November 24th, 2020. In spring, during the first wave, Ontario promised to put a so-called iron ring around seniors in long-term care. Tomorrow, we'll hear from the minister in charge on how well she thinks the government's done. Also, we'll get insights from long-term care experts who are currently coping with this second wave of COVID-19. And just before we go, a quick reminder, stay with us for the world premiere of the TVO original documentary, Running Wild, The Cats of Cornwall. It's coming up next and also available to stream anytime at tvo.org slash documentaries. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.